historically, uh, the church, especially the Reformed faith, has taught that the law of God has three primary uses. Now this overlaps some of what we've already discussed, but I thought it would be helpful for us to see this in terms of traditional Reformed theology. First, the law shows us the righteous character of God and, by way of contrast, shows us our sinfulness, resulting in our need of Christ as a Savior. You see, the law is not some arbitrary set of rules which God just thought up on a whim. You know, He wasn't sitting up in heaven and just said, you know, I think I'll make adultery illegal. No, the law is what it is because it reflects the very character of God. Adultery is wrong because God is a faithful God, and he always remains true to his covenant bond with his bride, the church, and so on through the rest of the law. So as we study the law, we learn more and more about the nature and character of God. But as we do that, we also see more and more how far short we fall of his character. We see God being absolutely faithful to his covenant bride, and we know how often we are unfaithful to our own covenant partners in thought, word, and deed. The more we learn of God's nature through the law, the more we know of our own lost condition. And that in turn shows us our need of a Savior and leads us to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. Once we truly see our lost estate, then we are ready to flee to Christ alone as our only hope. Unfortunately, in our day, as the church has abandoned the idea of the clear teaching of the law of God, we find that men feel no need of Christ. After all, why should I believe in Jesus? I'm just fine the way I am. It's only when men are confronted with the holy, righteous God who has revealed himself in his law that men will say, what must I do to be saved? Second, the law restrains the wickedness of the unregenerate. We might not think it does this because we see wickedness all around us. But think about a mundane example. If your fellow workers, if you work in a non-Christian business, if your fellow workers know you're a Christian, or especially if a preacher walks in the room, you know, he's got a collar on, a clerical collar, so it's obvious he's a preacher, you'll notice that your fellow workers quit cussing, or they apologize when they do. They know they're doing wrong, and they try to avoid it. And it works this way in general. Men know the law of God, since it's written on their heart by creation. And so they know they ought to help the poor, for example. They know it's not right to kill. They know that stealing is wrong. It restrains their sin. And see, Romans 1 tells us this, that they know the law of God. Now, while the ungodly don't follow the law as they should, yet they still tend to follow it in a general sense outwardly. Men know that murder is wrong, that stealing is wrong, and so on. So the law of God keeps the ungodly from being as wicked as they could be. Third, the law shows us as believers the standards for our life. As we look at the law, we see how we should live as God's children. Now remember what we've said before. In Exodus, we see that God gave the law to the people of Israel after he redeemed them from Egypt, not before. God didn't come to Israel when they were slaves in Egypt and say, here are my commandments. If you keep them, then I'll bring you out of Egypt. No, he delivered them from Egypt by his own grace, by his power. Then after he delivered them, he gave them the law. And so God gave the law to Israel to show them how to live as his redeemed covenant people. And it has the same function for us. God has given us the law, not so we can earn our salvation by it, but so that we can know what we should do as his special people out of gratitude for him, there's our heart attitude, and how we can glorify him. That's our goal. Now there's some similarities between a Christian view of the law and non-Christian legal approaches. For one thing, we do believe there's a definite right and wrong. There are absolute standards we follow. 
do love the Lord, don't commit idolatry, and so on. It's not just a matter of our heart attitude, and it's not just a matter of the situation or circumstances. The Bible teaches there are definite standards for right and wrong. But there are some distinct differences between a biblical view of law and non-Christian legal approaches. First, our standards come from God, not from trying to figure out from natural law what's right and wrong, not from surveys of people, not from some concept of universal principles. The Bible tells us what's right and wrong and gives us examples to help us understand it. Second, we don't believe our salvation is based on our keeping the law. We don't try to earn our way to salvation. We don't try to outweigh our bad works with good works or anything like that. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And our keeping the law is not part of that equation. Third, many legalistic approaches ignore the importance of the heart attitude. This was one of the problems of the Jews in Jesus' day. As long as you did the right things, your heart didn't matter. Jesus addressed this when he said it wasn't enough not to murder someone. If you hated them in your heart, you've sinned. Likewise, we believe that you have to consider the outcomes or results of your actions. Good actions, those that really keep the law, will have good results. If the outcomes are not right, then the actions are not right either. So in our next video, we're going to begin a brief look at the Ten Commandments. So before you move on to the next video, I would encourage you to open your Bible and read through the Ten Commandments. I want you to read them in Exodus 20 and then turn to Deuteronomy 5 and read them there. You'll get the bigger picture of all ten of the commandments.